Douglas Murray, you are back on the bookstore shelves with your brand new book, The War on the West. It's out today and already, based on pre-orders alone, you are number one on Amazon. That's fiction, non-fiction, that's absolutely everything. Um, we talk a lot about war at the moment, Ukraine, Russia, but this war on the West has got nothing to do with those, has it? No, it's got nothing to do with, with what's going on, the terrible events in Eastern Europe. Uh, I, I describe something which is a much longer conflict. It's a generational conflict, I claim, uh, which is a war on every single one of the underpinnings of what we in countries like Britain enjoy. Uh, I show in the book that there has grown in the last half century and then suddenly sped up in the last few years this unbelievable conflict that has been waged against every single one of the foundations of our society. So that today... The only group that it is permissible to say racist things about in society are white people, are the majority populations of countries like Britain, countries like America. Everything in our history has been torn down, has been deracinated, has been, has been taken away from us. All of our holy places, all of our great heroes have been one by one removed from us, have been assaulted and removed. Uh, so that even somebody like our greatest Britain, Winston Churchill now, is talked of for his guilt, not for his heroism. The, the same remorseless, racist, colonialist, slavery-based argument has been used against everybody from the British past and the Western past. The same thing has happened to everything in our religious culture, even our secular culture, our culture of rationalism of enlightenment, of reason, all of these things too are said to be the products merely of dead white males. And then finally, it even goes through everything in our culture so that our art galleries and other public art institutions, our libraries, even theatres, decide that their principal job is not to entertain or educate, but to decolonize. This is a movement against everything in our past, and everything in our present. It is an attempt to completely rewrite us as a country. And I've seen it growing in recent years. And I thought it's time not just to call it out and to identify it, but to push back against it. Well, you've done that with your previous hit books, The Madness of Crowds and The Strange Death of Europe, both massive bestsellers as well, as we know this one will continue to be. Um, but everything you've just said, I absolutely recognise. I think everyone viewing and, and listening right now will recognise. But the thing that perplexes lots of us, and I know you've looked into in the book, is, is where it's coming from. Who is doing this mm. and why are mm. they doing this? Yes. Uh, the first thing is, it comes principally, it has to be said, from America. Uh, it is an American movement from about the 60s, 70s onwards that decided to look at everything in American history through these lights, to say that slavery wasn't just a part of the story of America, but was the story of America. To say that, um, that, that, that racism wasn't just a part of American history, as regrettably, sadly, appallingly, it's been a part of every country's history. But it wasn't enough to say that it was a part of American history. They decided to say it was the entirety of American history, so that even today, even today, Americans are alleged to live in a white supremacist, uh, institutionally racist society. And this flooded through, this set of terrible, reductive, simplistic, and very, very antagonistic ideas flooded through the rest of the English-speaking West in particular. You don't see it as much in France and other countries on the continent, but you do see it very clearly in Britain, in Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand. These are countries that have all been encouraged to believe this. Now, here's the thing. It's spilled out from academia, as almost all bad ideas do. But it, it, it long ago went past academia. I give examples in the book of, think of that, book from 20, 20 years ago, a very popular book of Michael Moore's, Stupid White Men. Mm. You know, you would never, ever expect there to be allowed a book called Stupid Black Men, nor would you want to publish or read such a thing. But it became permissible to talk about white people alone in this very, very racist light. And then in recent years, that sped up. And I'll tell you why I think it happened. I think, among other things, it happened because, firstly, there are people in Britain as well who actually believe this about our society. Yeah. They actually believe that we live in the most oppressive 
patriarchal, cis heteronormative, and crucially racist society. But this is the very imagine. bizarre They've thing, never... isn't it? Because it seems to be supposedly mm. the most educated, the most liberal, the most uh, you know globally thinking. The sort of people who say they're a global citizen, not uh, not a, a Britain, mm. who, who seem to think this. And I do wonder: have they never been abroad? Have they never have they never exactly. read any books? Have they have never seen any TV, read any articles about the rest of the world? It, it's very very obvious to me that that this and you you touch on this in the book at a great length. You know, is that the, the, it's very interesting that the countries that people most want to flee to from other parts of the world mm. are the countries that apparently are so despicable and awful and terrible with the worst history. That's a bit strange, That's right. isn't it? That's right. Uh, I mean, we know that we can't be what these new critics claim we are, because if we were, the world wouldn't want to be coming to us. It's, it's important that we do talk about the things that went wrong in the past. That's how we well, learn. And we talk about slavery. There is nobody walking around in America, Britain, Canada, Australia, was saying, yep, slavery, absolutely not a problem, glad we did it. Absolutely. Of course not. It was an yeah. appalling abomination. But again, accepting that it was a bad thing, but that we were not the first empire to do it. <laughs> we were yes. probably the last empire to do it. It's still we were, going on in large parts we, of, the country, of, of the world right now. And we were the country that helped to end it. But this is never mentioned yes. as part of this attack on That's the right. West. There seems to be a presumption, Julia, uh, on the part of the activists who are anti-Western, that, that they seem to be at the very kindest observation about a century out of date, at the very <laughs> kindest estimation. Uh, I went through all the school curricula in the UK and the US. Slavery is one of the fundamental things that children are taught in education, in history, in all of our schools. Um, colonialism is taught in all of our schools. These are not hidden histories. It's not the case that the National Trust and Kew Garden and the Tate Gallery and all of our, our institutions have to decolonize our country because we're so ignorant and we've all been taught that the colonies were just great. It's not the case at all, at all. Uh, so the best thing you can say is that these people are wildly out of date. But here's the other thing. As you say, Julia, the remarkable thing about Britain, for instance, was not that we had slavery, as every, every society in history had had up until that date. The remarkable thing about Britain is not just that we ended it for ourselves, but spent blood and treasure that meant for the 19th century, our ships patrolled the high seas, mm -hmm to make sure that it was made illegal for other countries as well. And what's interesting, of course, is this idea that everything that's come out of the West is, is somehow bad, not just yes. slavery. We uniquely invented slavery, again, completely factually wrong, as you say, but also you know, the Industrial Revolution, scientific, medical breakthroughs that have been huge. You know, <laughs> look at yeah. what we've just been dealing with with COVID. Which were the countries that came up with those vaccines? Oh, well, it was right. the West, interestingly. But this, yes. this need, this urge to to only see the bad instead of the good, the bad, the ugly, and seeing you know everything in the round. And yet they don't make the same ju same judgments of other countries, other regimes, and other parts of the world. Why not? No, they d they don't at all. In fact, quite the opposite. They seem to believe that every other country has people born into a sort of Edenic innocence. We are all born into guilt, but uh, everyone else is born into Edenic innocence. And it's simply not the case. One of my contentions in the book is one of the reasons why this war has been pushed on us is because hostile actors, including the Chinese Communist Party, have relished in recent years and reveled in this Western self-flagellation. And indeed, they encourage it. Because whilst we are talking about what we did two centuries ago, the Chinese Communist Party has, of course, a system of concentration camps going on in Xinjiang province as we speak. Uh, just recently, one of the organs of the Chinese Communist Party put out a, a, a um, a, a meme, a cartoon on, on, on Twitter claiming that America is a country of racism and George Floyd and, and family separations at the border. You know, you could ask the Uyghurs, uh, the Uyghur Muslims, whether the Chinese Communist Party really cares about family separation or racism or anything like it. But these countries find it enormously convenient that Britain and America at this point in our history would decide that we, we of all countries are the bad guys and they take advantage of it at the UN, on the international stage, on a daily basis.
So, uh, Douglas, um, a lot of the ideas we've been talking about have been very much on the fringe. It was just something happening in some rather strange little universities over in the United States. And then it came over here a bit and people were going, oh, well, it's just a bunch of loony lefties. Who cares? But now it's everywhere. This War on the West, the title of your best-selling new book, is happening 24-7, 365, all over the place. It's happening in our universities, in our businesses, in our government. And a lot of people are very worried about this. I know a lot of parents in our schools as well. Yes. Why does it matter that we confront this and that we, well, take on the war and actually start fighting back? Well, well first, you're completely right, Julie. It is through every single part of British society now. Uh, as I say in the book, and look at anyone who wants a, a public appointment in the UK now must pass the diversity, inclusion and equity testing that the civil service and others force on everyone. Mm -hmm. And that diversity and inclusion and, F, uh, and, and equity testing means you've got to demonstrate that, uh, that you are diverse. Well, diversity in its essence is anti-Western. Because the West, of course, is a is a multicultural, multi glot place. But once you say it, it, it has no identity of itself other than that, then you are in the realms of what I describe as anti-Westernism. To demonstrate that you have a commitment to diversity says it's not enough, for instance, just to be proud of your country and want to see it do well. You've got to be committed to another ethic other than just Britain yeah. and Britain doing well in the world. This has run through everything, uh, corporations, private companies. It, you know, long ago, as the writer Andrew Sullivan said, we, it was the case that we all live on university now. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, why, why does it matter? Why it matters is because as parents up and down Britain know, their children are indoctrinated into versions of this stuff. Uh, if you look at the polling of what ch of what young people actually know, how few of them have heard of almost any foreign despot, how few of them have heard of Chairman Mao or Stalin, you see that we are presenting a version of history that is incredibly narrow lens in which we are the only bad guys and we don't know anything much about everyone else. Now, here's the thing. The particular evil in this is the evil I, I identify in the first chapter, which is the evil of anti-white racism. Yeah. All racism is evil. But the only one that is permissible in our age is anti-white racism. But, it, but the strange thing children... is it's coming from white people. It's white yes. left-wing liberals, so-called, who exactly. are hating not just other white people, but everything the white people have done in the past and in the present, but That's also right. hating presumably themselves as well. Where, where, what is the well, motivation? I'm not sure they do hate themselves. Oh. They love themselves. They're great narcissists themselves. They want everyone else to hate themselves. <laughs> so that white people are told that we are born into a specific type of sin. You know, if we said, I don't know, black people have to be regarded as being born into a particular type of sin because of what their ancestors did uh, and, and said all of their ancestors were slavers, whereas actually only some of their ancestors were slavers. If we said, therefore, in the 21st century, all black people are born into sin, we would not have a problem identifying who that person was. We would say, there's a racist right there. Well, it's the same with the anti-white racists. These are racists who hate white people and believe it is possible to tell white people that from the cradle they are guilty of the sins of their forebears. You, you know, Julia, that, that the ethic of not, um, not levelling the sins of the father on the son is a very important ethic. You know, we don't blame people for what their parents did or their grandparents did, except when it comes to white Westerners, where we are held responsible for things we had nothing to do with. I had nothing to do with slavery or colonialism. Neither did you. Both of these things um, finished years before we were born. And, and, and for most white we people born. in the West, their families like mine would have been, you know, peasant farmers. I mean, or people well, working in the mills. The, the idea that the, the ancestors of white people in the West were having a whale of a time, I don't know, exactly. to be at banquets all the time with their, yes. you know, and, and living in gold carriages. It's a nonsense, isn't it? And, that, yes. and that's not I in mean, any way to, to, to make it light of the horrors of slavery. No, but I mean, the past was hell for everybody. You know, yeah. I, I, make this, I make this point, I, I, I say at one point, it, it just does not do down the, 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 the appallingness of the slave trade, but, but 
in the 19th century, uh, did people have white privilege if they were white? No, of yeah. course not. Of course yeah. not. The average mill worker in the north of England died in his late 30s, which actually was younger than many um, people working on slave plantations. Uh, it doesn't do away that, with, the, with the evil of slavery, but, but, but the, those people forced to work in mills or mines, they weren't privileged. Mm -hmm. And yet we've entered this incredibly hostile, reductive, American, zero-sum, aggressive, racist game that says all white people are yes. privileged and everyone who was white in history is privileged and all of our ancestors were privileged. Absolutely rubbish. And then you fall into the thing of, and then all white people are guilty. Absolute rubbish. Yes. No white person is guilty because of how they were born. Okay. We, like everybody else, should be held to account for things that we have done, not for things that people who may have looked like us in history may have done. Indeed. Um, and just briefly, finally, I mean, the thing that I find about so interesting about this is, is people who have such a negative view of the world and, and of the present as well as of the past, because there has mm. never been a better time to be alive. Um, people Absolutely. live more, people live longer, happier, healthier lives than ever before. And that is largely down to... Western civilization. Yes, that's right. I give at the end of the book, you know, a remorseless list of all of the things that the world, the world owes the West. You know, the scientific method, as you mentioned at the beginning, if you want a vaccine, if you want to try to find a cure for degenerative diseases or, 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 or cancers, you don't go to the indigenous peoples of Australia or the First Nations peoples of America. You, you look for the people who are exercising the Western scientific method. And here's the thing, everybody in the world can use it. It's not there because it's white. It's there because it works. It's the same thing with so much more. And all of this is being attacked as if we have produced nothing, when in fact the West has produced more than anyone. And a final point, if I may, why we allow why we allow this assault on ourselves is one of the great mysteries to, to, to me, which I try to answer and say we've got to stop. When Sadiq Khan two years ago ordered a Robespierrean style commission into, the, into what in London we are allowed to keep of our history and what we must replace, I say no. Apart from the fact that the people he put in it were all very, very unpleasant, as far as I can see, anti-British, anti-Western activists. No, we will not have committees of hostile actors deciding what from our past we're allowed to remember and then shoving up a few banal things from the present to pretend that it's our past. Okay. We don't live in 1984. We're not prisoners of these people. We're not prisoners of our worst critics. We're free people who have the right to feel pride in our past and pride in our present and to do better things in the future. Douglas Murray, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure.